Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Grateful to you as always. Give me just a second as I'm letting in our cohort. And awesome. Uh, first of all, welcome to uh, the Needle you know, Marketing Town Hall, which is becoming my favorite time of the week. Uh, really appreciate everybody who's continuing to show up. I think it's super cool that we've got such an engaged group. Um, we're going to be doing individual presentations today. So if your school is open and you have something to share, please chat me because I'd love to um, turn the spotlight on you. Um, and uh, I'd like to make this as collaborative and, and um, you know, kind of open communication as possible. Uh, I'm really excited for our uh, speaker and presenter today. Um, her name is Christy McAllister. She's the head of school at Centen Centennial Montessori. Christy, thanks for being here. Really grateful to you. No problem. And the way I see this going is um, Christy's going to present. She's got a great presentation for us. Uh, if you have questions in the interim, feel free to chat them in. I'll be moderating chat. Um, if the question feels like it needs to be answered in the moment, I'll, I'll do what I can to interrupt Christy. But otherwise, I think for the most part, we're probably going to hold the questions until the end. Um, and then after the fact, we'll move into uh, group discussion. Feel free to contribute uh, to my attendees. Uh, I want to talk just specifically to my shy people uh, who we love. I have to imagine that there's just a wealth of um, knowledge on this call. And sometimes uh, I venture to say that that's kept under a lid or in a bottle. And I would strongly encourage you to maybe venture out of your shell just a little bit because the whole world is going to benefit from it. And you're on a call with nothing but Montessorians. So you have to imagine it's the most receptive and kind and gracious group um, to uh, uh, present yourself to. So you don't have to share your camera if you don't want to. Um, you don't even necessarily have to talk. If you want to just chat it in, you can, you can chat in and uh, I'll do my best to help, you know, represent whatever you're saying. But if you want to come out and, and, and share, we'd love to have you. So with that said, Christy, can I turn it over to you? Yep, for sure. Awesome. Um, and I'm really terrible at monitoring any chats. So um, definitely like jump in if, if um, I won't be able to respond. No problem. Um, I'm also, job. if people, I can go as short or as long as you want. So if people um, say in the chat that they want to, you know, contribute, then just like call me off and I'm happy to stop. So um, I'd love to hear other people's opinions too and, and what's going on. Um, so I have, um, I have prepared slides because I know everybody always loves to get all the resources. So um, the slides are more for reading than for presenting. I will present them, but just so you know, there's a lot of extra information on there. Um, and when I put them through in a PDF, the links should remain. Um, so anything that's linked in there is the link to the actual document. So you should be able to um, grab that. Uh, some of them are protected for our community, so you will get an approval notice, and then I'll just approve you. So if you can just say what school you're from. Um, but um, otherwise, I think that's kind of the housekeeping stuff. Um, and so I'm going to, um, I guess, let me just start. Probably easiest to just start, um, not try and figure out sharing the screen while I'm talking. So hold on one sec. Uh, there's a little, there we go. Yep, I got it. I'm just slow. Um, so hold on, I'm just going to get this up. Okay, so, um, so basically I thought it would be a little bit helpful just to know, because I, you know, what you do in terms of opening is really going to depend a lot on your particular school. So I wanted to kind of give you an overview of our school just so you know sort of some of the things that may be different for us and, and you know, you may do some things differently just because you have a totally different population. Um, we are in the Bay Area in San Mateo. Um, it's an area of high COVID-19 mitigation. Um, we're right next to Santa Clara, which is one of the four original hotspots um, put on the CDC website. And basically we have people from, you know, the areas kind of um, are commingled. Um, so it's, a lot of our regulations are probably more strict than some places, but um, uh, so we started just in terms of the school, we started with just eight children in my living room. Neither of those houses is my house. Um, we now have four buildings on two properties um, and two, six classrooms. So we've got two YCC, Young Children's Community, uh, two children's house classrooms, and then two elementary classrooms. 
We've got 15 staff members. Um, this is one thing that has really helped us is we have our children's house has assistants that are trained um, because they, they function as assistants, but they speak in a different language. Um, so that allows us to do cohorts a little easier for our, our children's house. So that would be one difference from some, some schools. Um, we also have one full-time admin, that's me, um, and then two part-time admin. Uh, so we're fairly bare bones that we still kind of re maintain a pretty homey environment, literally, because we're in two homes across the street from each other. Um, we've got 110 students, 60 are in that top house, um, and they're the under six, and or six and under, and then 50 are the six to 12. Um, and then I also put on that we have a wait list of 70. And the reason I put that on is just so that I think there are, we are pretty hard on certain things that we say. Um, and I, to be honest, I was that way when we were started with eight children in my living room and we're growing the school. Um, but it also is easier to do because we do have a wait list. Of course, we don't want to lose any of our families. Um, but in terms of financially, at least we did as of March 20th, who knows what the wait list would be now. Um, and then our, our, the other factor that kind of influenced our decisions is our public schools are unlikely to go back more than two days um, a week, if at all. Uh, so that gives us, you know, in terms of comparison to the public school, there's a lot that we can offer, um, even if it's not perfect. So that kind of gives you an overview. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I just thought some people might want to know what we did between March 16th and March 4th. Um, and we basically switched our focus in the young children's community and children's house to parent education and parent consultation, um, thinking that that was, you know, this is a great time to be able to work on Montessori in the home and it's a great opportunity to connect more with parents. Um, we had distance learning though at all levels, um, including Google Classroom for every class. The Google Classroom was for the parents if it was anything other than upper elementary, um, the children weren't on it. And then, um, we did different coffee chats and meetings and that kind of thing. So I can go through that more in detail, but one of the reasons that I put it in is because um, we did not refund any tuition, but we have the benefit of our tuition is collected between June and February. So all of the year's tuition was already paid by February 1st, and that made it pretty easy um, to let people know that I wasn't going to be refunding tuition and we were offering what we could and, and people were fine with that. We did end up refunding summer deposits, which are also paid in February. Um, but we ended up doing a summer program now. So because we opened, um, we opened this past Monday for most of our children and the Monday before for um, a few, few others, a uh, few kids to start. Um, we also during this time, um, thank you to Aiden Montessori, we kind of copied you guys. Um, but we um, did a learning at home website that had a bunch of different activities that the children could do. And one of the reasons that I put this up is as we went forward, this became sort of our virtual community room where we would post anything that we did here. And it was sort of a repository for everything that we did so that parents had an easy place they could go to find the slides from the coffee chat or the video from a forum that we did. Um, and the other reason that I, I'm kind of touching on this is I think um, Matt talked about it uh, last week that communication is so important when you're reopening. And I think that was one thing that um, we, some of the things that we're able to do are I think because we have really worked hard on communication throughout this time and really connecting with parents and making sure that they're comfortable because essentially, you know, it is scary to send your child back to school in this environment. Um, and I have five children, so I understand I'm sending them back at all levels of development from um, children's house up through uh, university. Um, and so it is scary. And, and I think also we found in terms of communication, one thing that I would really recommend is that you move outside of your comfort zone for how to communicate. I did, I don't usually do Zoom talks. Um, and um, I found that parents are really stressed and in, in my life I've experienced trauma and I recognize some of the effects in parents. And, and for example, 
really together parents who just couldn't make meetings or forgot about you know things all the time or you know memory deficits cognitive deficits and i think people are really having a hard time um you know incorporating information and i think that's getting better but initially especially um whether they were actually traumatized or it was just a, a such a shock so I really encourage you to do all sorts of different communication. So we did um, you know, Zoom talks that were live and then we recorded them. We sent out preview emails beforehand to kind of give a sense of what we were gonna talk about. Um, and then we made sure they were pretty visual. Um, and then we had a, we used our website to have a place to put all of that so everybody could find it anytime they wanted to. Um, we also really, this is part of our website. It was the first time I ever made a website, so I'm kind of proud of it. But um, the uh, communication with teachers, we did weekly Zoom meetings, so the parents had really communication with teachers and that really connected them. I think that really helped with the tuition payment as well, the, the idea of paying it, because they felt really good about supporting these people that they were now seeing more regularly. Um, I put down some of the topics that we used there. Um, we also did weekly coffee chats, and those were some of the topics that we did there. And then I put the recordings um, on online. Um, and then we also sent out surveys. And so these are some of our surveys, and you're welcome to use them as you wish. Um, and then we also and, um, did a new waiver for coming back to school. So this is kind of all of the groundwork that we laid before we rolled out our reopening plan. Um, and I think if, if you are planning to reopen within the next month, two months, this is the type of thing that really has helped people feel very comfortable. It doesn't take that much time. I actually have not done too many individual meetings with parents. I always take them if they want them. Um, but I've just done a lot of group meetings and, and it really reinforces the community and helps us feel connected. Um, so, and I should say thank you very much to all of the schools that contributed because a lot of this work is not mine. So in our plan to reopen, so again, we, we opened for about a third of our children on Monday, this past Monday, and the week before that we opened for five YCC children. Um, just to start. And so now we have um, basically a third of our children back at all levels. Um, June 1st for us was a really important date because that is the first date of tuition for the 2020-2021 the 2020, year. And we get about half of our tuition in on June 1st. And so in terms of financial planning, that was really important to have a plan before June 1st. And then also, I felt like June 1st was a really good indication of how many people were coming back because I went from everything to, okay, you know, this is the school that I started and we've had a good run and maybe this is it. Like, I don't know that I want to do distance learning. I don't know that I want to keep going with this. It's crazy. And, you know, there were definitely times where I was like, you know, it's, it's good. The kids are happy with their parents. <laughs> Stay there. Um, but so I really needed to find out um, how many people were were planning on coming back. Um, and, you know, in this uncertainty, I got a lot of questions about, you know, that seemed to say that people were not coming back. And I think that was just a lot of the fear. Because once um, we decided, okay, if we're going to open, we need to have a plan. And because of that um, need for certainty before June 1st, we came up with a plan and it was basically based on the requirements, of course, that we have to, um, to fulfill. And then as well, the recommendations. But I really encourage those of you who are, who are creating a plan to reopen to look at the science also, because of course you need to do the, the requirements and you should definitely pay attention to the recommendation. But there's a lot of fear-based planning out there right now where parents and the state and the federal, you know, not as much the federal government want to really protect everything. Um, so think about what actually makes sense. And one example I would give is um, for fomite transmission, transmission on surfaces. There is not a lot of evidence that there's transmission of this in any high rate on surfaces. Um, 
we have very specific cleaning rituals that we need to go through because we're in San Mateo and we absolutely are doing those and we're doing them according to the regulations. But we're also not going crazy on it because they're really in actual fact is not that much evidence that it's that um, has that much impact. And we've kept a pretty clean environment before anyway. Um, you will see though that we do have to clean materials between use and what we've done to do that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, there really is very good um, evidence that the children are not transmitting the way we thought that they were, even either they're certainly not getting it and not transmitting as much. So just thinking about, you know, what does the science actually say? Um, obviously, we have to stay within our role as, as heads of school, but that's what kind of informed my decisions. Um, so I decided to open under the guidelines for essential care workers for the first eight weeks. Um, because I knew that we could always return to that and hopefully stay open as much as possible. And I also felt like parents would be um, comfortable with that. And the other reason for that is there was when we decided to open before June 1st, there was really no guidelines from anywhere on what to do. So I felt like those were the guidelines we could be sure of. I also decided we needed a summer program because I didn't want to start school with, you know, all hundred some children all at the same time. Um, so we started reopening forums. So every other week, starting on May 14th, we had a forum, a Zoom forum where parents could attend and we would just kind of give an update on where we were. And then we put all of that on a web page so they could access the videos and the slides for that. Um, and when I say we, I mean, that's the royal we, I guess, because I um, don't have a whole huge staff. But anyway, um, so May, 28th, for, the May 14th, I didn't bother putting up the slides because it was pretty preliminary, um, but the May 28th program gives you a lot of details of what we told the parents in terms of our on-campus plan. And then the June 11th one kind of, we said, okay, we've got sort of a plan for our on-campus one and here's the update. And then here's our thoughts on the distance plan. On July 2nd, we're gonna do an update on how the summer's going. And then July 23rd, we'll do our absolute final plan with revisions from the, our summer program. Our summer program is running from June, um, uh, so let's see, what is it? Last week, whatever date that was, June 17th, I think, um, through to the end of July. And then on August 11th, we're gonna go right back into a welcome back to school. Um, and I put this out for parents right away because I want them to have certainty. I think the more certainty they have, the better. And we are, like it or not, in a unique position to offer that certainty in a very uncertain time to the extent that we can. And so I ended it with welcome back to school to give the parents a sense that, you know, even right from the start, this is leading to your child coming back on campus. Um, and I felt like that was um, comforting to people. Um, so um, what I did to explain it to them in that first couple of forums was talk about, you know, health and safety is obviously first, but we want to balance that with social emotional health and familial economic realities. Um, I went through why Montessori is uniquely suited for this challenge. Um, and you'll see the superhero, the, that's basically not just superheroes. That's also like, we actually saw a lot of superhero play um, and we don't typically do characters and that kind of thing at our school. And the parents were saying, all of a sudden they're into superheroes. I was like, well, doesn't that make sense? You know, this is such, this is a time when they want to be invincible. And so let them play superheroes because that's what they need right now. Um, so anyway, just it's the concept of adapting and, and Montessori really looking at the child and what they need and what they need in a very challenging environment. Um, you can read that separately. You all know that. Um, and then I also went over the evidence um, from science about how children are affected. I would be very careful if you choose to use this slide that you are comfortable using it, just a kind of a heads up, because I'm very comfortable with my community. Um, and, you know, saying that last line, do your own research, this is just to illustrate my thinking on why I feel that it's okay to go back to school, even though transmission rates are rising. And remember, we're in California, so it's, the news is a little scary right now. Um, 
So I feel comfortable doing this, but I would be careful that you couch it in, this is a window into my thoughts, not presenting scientific material that we don't have the authority really to present. And it's all cited um, by the studies and everything. Um, this is another thing that I think is really helpful um, for our community to do right away, which was to very clearly say right away, and we did this in our first communication in the beginning of distance learning that we would not be offering um, tuition refunds. And so going forward, what we had was we had people say, that's great, Christy, we totally understand we want to support the teachers. It was fine for this period of distance learning where it was all surprised, but for next year, if you're thinking we're going to go to distance learning, we're not comfortable paying for it. Is there going to be a break for distance learning? So I couched it in the community financial costs instead of my financial costs or their financial costs. Um, and just looking at, look, we price ourselves at 75% of other area schools. So you're going to see other area schools possibly offer tu tuition discounts. I doubt it because it's a lot more expensive to uh, operate, but we don't have that room in our, in our budget to do that. Um, and I kind of gave them a rundown and you can read this on your own, but I gave them a rundown of all the things that are costing us. And then I put in the bottom, we also understand that you guys are going to incur additional costs, particularly at the YCC and children's house level, if you need to hire nannies for closures. Um, and we get that. We, we understand that your costs are going up too. So what can we do for you? And these are direct slides for, from presentations. So it's couched to parents. Um, so I said, we will not be increasing tuition to, to cover the additional cost. And I think that's really important that people um, think about talking about it that way. Everyone's asking for tuition re reductions. And I think saying to parents, this is costing so, so, so much more, but don't worry, we're not going to increase tuition, unless you have to, obviously, um, gives them the understanding that you have a decision to make too. Um, and then I, we said very clearly in the second line with the big, you know, hazard sign, um, we cannot offer tuition reductions for periodic distance learning. Families must decide whether they can absorb the cost of tuition given the possibilities of closure. And I just feel like being very upfront, families have a real economic reality that they have to figure out, um, but we do too. And so um, just being clear with what we can do. And then what you can do, we, we did open up our financial aid um, but we still use the same process uh, to assess it. And then um, you can change the payment plan from yearly to monthly. So some people pay yearly and I, if they want to pay monthly, that's fine. Um, and then I said, you have your commitment that we will try our best to stay open unless it's unsafe to do so. Um, and that way we would reduce the additional childcare. Um, and so, how do we stay open? So one of the ways we stay open is we work under essential care facility guidelines. It's the safest option. And hopefully if we do have a big closure, we would be able to stay open even through a closure, which is what we intend to do is to try and stay open. Sorry, that's my dog cat barking in the background. Um, we also have asked licensings to be a pop-up childcare for um, school age kids. And we won't get that approval until it actually we actually have to close, but that's something that our license can, um, said was a possibility, which I can talk about later if you want. Um, we're also maximizing on-campus learning by changing the, the calendar. We're bringing teachers back two weeks early. Um, this is for the regular school year. We're starting with one week of student family one-on-ones, uh, one week of training and, and all that, and then that. And then we are bringing children back a week early. We have a two week spring break, so we're doing a flex week on April 5th to 9th where we can use it if we need to and then we're using the last the week after the last week of school as a flex week and so to the, for three weeks we have built in where we don't have to do a distance learning we can just build extra weeks into the school year. Um, also I wanted to mention that in going back we right from the start because our public schools are only going back two days we told parents that we will not be holding class on Fridays um, for the first four weeks at all. And that allows us to have more professional development and kind of a um, chance to facilitate any distance learning. And then after four weeks, we're gonna add Friday mornings, but we're not adding Friday afternoons for the whole school year. And I think the teachers are gonna need that for professional development and for distance learning um, facilitation. 
because we are going to have people home um, at some points. Um, this is kind of what happened with all of that planning. So basically, we had 106 families enrolled. I won't go through all of it, but basically everybody's coming back and even the people who are doing distance learning are paying full tuition. Um, so I think that indicates people are pretty comfortable. Two families did switch from full year to monthly payments, so that indicates a little bit of you know, insecurity, but in general, I think people are pretty comfortable with the plan. Um, so I can go through a lot of this, the rest of this is um, laid out pretty clearly for you to read. So do you want, do, do you have, do you want me to stop and have people? I have some questions uh, ready for you, Christy, if you're ready. Sure. Um, what are your current class sizes? So our current class sizes are 10 and we just got permission to go up to 12, but we'll stay at 10 for summer and then go to 12. What are your hours of operation? We're doing mornings right now uh, for the summer so that we don't have to deal with transitions. And then um, during the regular school year, we were able to get everybody back on their regular schedules. For the Zoom calls, were they with the entire community or just uh, by classroom? Um, teacher calls were by classroom and then my calls were with the entire community. Okay. Uh, and then Susanna asked, what time of day did you do your coffee chats? Were you happy with the parent turnout? We tried a few, but the parent turnout was extremely low, demoralizingly low. Uh, we have we have pretty good turnout, but we always, we kept it the same time as our live one. So every Wednesday afternoon for the first four weeks of the school year, I do a coffee chat at a coffee house usually on, um, let's see, it's 8.30 right after drop off on Wednesdays. And then, um, then after the first four weeks, we do one once a month. And so we went to every week during distance and obviously on Zoom, um, but we kept the same time. So people were used to it already. And so we got probably a third of parents. I didn't mean to interrupt, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Were the Zooms interactive? Could parents ask questions or was it webinar style? Um, I did a short presentation between 10, and, 10 minutes and a half hour. And then the rest was um, questions. And I would stay on pretty long. You know, I'd stay on as long as there's questions. So sometimes it was an hour, sometimes it was an hour and a half. And Heidi was asking, uh, should, I'd like to hear how reopening forums with parents have been going. Um, great. I mean, I think one of the things was having this continual um, coffee chats and, and ways for them to connect. Nothing was surprising. Um, and it was the way we laid it out, we kind of laid out the challenges first. And I think one of the things I found with parents is there's a natural inclination, obviously, to care about your own child and to, you know, be your child's advocate. Um, but as, as much as they're invited into the process of understanding all of the things that you're trying to figure out, the more you can change their focus to a community focus. And so one of the things that has really helped is with all of these coffee chats, our community really is community focused. I mean, we, we have, I have many families suggesting things like, I don't want my child to wear a mask, but um, I don't feel comfortable not doing it because I know that there's children who, who need it. Or, you know, if you need me to go just, I, you know, had several parents say, if I have to do distance so that somebody else can have a spot that can't do distance, who's working, you know, I could, we could do that. We can facilitate that. So, it's been really great um, that the community discussion has been refocused to how do we solve this problem together. That's amazing. Uh, Karen was asking what was in the Zoom talks from a topical perspective, but you included that list later. So I think Karen, we have that question answered. Let me know if we don't. Yeah, so I'll put it up while we're talking. Awesome. And then Wally's asking how many children are currently attending, which I also think was in one of the slides. Um, so yeah, it's 106. Oh, currently attending is uh, 30, 40. Uh, do you use WordPress for the website? I use Google Sites. And I've never done one before, so it's really easy. <laughs> yeah, they make it super easy. Um, yeah. Beth asking, do they have to wear masks all day? Beth, does that refer to the students or the teachers? So I can tell you both. Um, so we have, when we opened, um, oh, here's one thing that you might want to see. So this is our check. We had to have a pre-opening televisit 
Um, and this is the checklist they sent us for the licensing visit, which I'm sure they don't mind if it's shared. So, um, so if you want to see kind of the, the different things we had to do, a lot of signs. There's signs all over the place, um, which is not great, but it is what it is. Um, and then we applied for certain waivers. So in California, the teachers have to wear masks. The children at this point do not, but that might change. They're deciding based on um, Newsom's new law mandating masks for everyone. Um, definitely under two don't have to. So we applied for the following waivers, which were, some of them were approved. One was face shields for teachers instead of masks, um, as long as they're outside of six feet. And that was, our concern was the language development and also not being able to see the, um, the expressions of the teacher, particularly with new students. So they approved face shields and the condition is, as soon as you get within six feet, you have to put a mask on. Um, which we have the, so we have the children do not, their mother, their parents, and not their mother, their parents choose um, that they want them to. Um, for the regular school year, one of our cohort preference questions is that um, they, if, if they want to wear masks, whether you want to wear masks or not, and we're going to design cohorts so that there's a masked cohort and a non-masked co cohort. Um, and then children need to wear masks if they're collaborating with another child very, in very close sustained you know, distance uh, for a sustained amount of time, or if they are getting a lesson, and that's to protect teachers. We don't believe that there's much transmission. There's really very little evidence of it from children to adults, but we want to be on the safe side. Carrie's asking, will you have aftercare during the school year, mixing groups, and if so, until what time? We're not, we are not doing aftercare. Um, we don't typically do it anyway for, except to match our elementary program. So it's maybe an hour on either side. Um, and we've told parents that at this point, we don't think we can accommodate it. If, if it works out that we can do one cohort that stays longer, we will. Um, but we have, that's not our priority in determining cohorts. Um, and um, I would say one of the things I'll show you Oh, here's our little class social distancing. Um, so we, you can see we set up the outdoors with tables. There's a shade structure that will go on top of that, but of course didn't arrive in time. Um, we've set up tables in the classroom so that they're socially distanced. The children have their own rugs. Um, we're doing social distancing, grace and courtesy. It's one thing I will tell you is our elementary is a little more challenging, but our toddlers in our children's house are beautiful with the social distancing. They have that mathematical mind. They know what six feet is. We had, I was there yesterday morning and I walked in and a child was just standing there. And I said, what's, what's going on? Are you trying to go somewhere? And they're just standing patiently. And she said, yeah, but I don't have enough room. And it, you know, I looked and I was, there was two teachers standing and there seemed to be to an adult plenty of room, but she had internalized the six feet and she's like, I can't get past you. I'm just waiting until you, you move. Um, so, so they really, I mean, in some ways it's a little sad too, but um, they've internalized it quite easily. Um, the, here you can see two little boys working together. And of course I had to block their face so you don't see, but they just, they both have masks on. And we have a little pouch that goes, we have disposable masks. And then we have a little pouch that goes around their, their, um, their neck if they bring their own. And so then they put, put it in there so it's not hanging out. Um, that has not been that big of a deal. It's, it's, you know, it was one of my biggest concerns, one of the parents' biggest concerns. And the kids are just like, okay, you know, they wear it. And a lot of them have cute little prints and they're happy to wear. Um, so... Um, the lower left shows a table where we put, it's called our not ready table. Um, and so whenever the children finish the work, instead of returning it to the shelf, they bring it over to the table and it's cleaned um, either with, um, when it's in the classroom, it's cleaned with hypochlorous acid, which is, you can have around the children. Um, we don't have them usually standing right there when we're doing it, but, or a UV wand. Um, and then it's returned to the shelf. Um, admin does sweeps of every half hour to an hour we walk through and see if the teacher has been able to keep up with that or not. And if not, then we'll just step in and try and help them get stuff back on the shelf. 
but that was another one of my big concerns was having the materials unused. And then I stopped and thought about it and was like, there's only 10 to 12 children in the class. Those materials would have been being used by other children anyway. So it's actually kind of the same way that you know, if you have very few children in a class, you pretend to be busy, so you're not so so available to them. Um, and so I think it's it actually works out really well. Um, another thing I'll mention is, in terms of things you can ask for from licensing, we ask to commingle the toddler option and the preschool cohort. So that's their using their words. So our 18 months to three year olds and our three year olds to six year olds in the case of severe staff shortages, and that was approved. So if we can't staff so that we would have to close down, we can bring our toddlers into the children's house. Um, and obviously we would only do that if we really felt like we knew them, but there's a lot of siblings in there too. So we felt comfortable with that um, and it would allow us to stay open. Um, we, would, we did say that we would bring them in with a younger group, so, um, we do have one cohort that is not going to be mixed aged because we don't have enough uh, older children to put them in four cohorts. So we also asked for a visual verbal sign in instead of a signature. So and we're waiting on that. We asked for two entry points instead of one central one, which is what's required um, so that we can have the children enter the building in separate entrances. And then we were approved for a pop up tent for child isolation because our concern was if we have more than one sick child um, and because we're in the house, we have to walk the children through the classroom if we are to the isolation area. And so this allows us to, to change that. So I think thinking about what you need to make it work and being really open with your licensing analyst and you know, if you have a good relationship with them, they were, I'm always scared of them. <laughs> um, but um, but this they they're figuring it out too. And if you just take the perspective of like how can we get this done together, um, they really were great um, and they were really helpful. Um, yeah. yeah. More questions? Yes, ma'am. Quite a few more. I'm gonna try to play rapid fire if you're game. Um, okay. How do you drop off in the morning taking temperatures? Toddlers and program now for summer. Oh, you just synchronized it perfectly. Um, so here's the card drop-off line. So we have a card drop-off line for both sites. We stagger by 15 minutes, so, uh, and that's working really well. Um, this, what you see here is for walkers. So if they walk, we've got things set up on the, we're in a residential area, so we had to talk to our neighbors about this, but um, they just stop at the different points um, and then they don't come until the, their motion to come, come forward. We, um, the, one of the things that we changed, we thought we were going to have teachers greet the children, but we have changed it to admin because we want only the people without being, that are not linked to the school functioning, which is the teachers, um, to be exposed to parents. So if a parent comes, is, the parent is the most likely to come down with something, and if only admin is exposed to it, we can work from home, whereas the teachers can't work from home. Um, so we are the ones that do the drop off. We're gloved, we're masked. Um, and when I first saw them, you know, I, I approached them without the mask um, from a distance so that they saw that it's still me. And then I said, oh, I'm going to put on this silly mask. Um, and they're used to it now and it, it was fine. Um, and we had a few new children start too, which was a little trickier, um, but it, it, that worked as well. Um, we, the parents stay in the car. We ask the COVID screening questions. We take the child's temperature while they're still in the car. Um, we did not take temperatures the first day and we made that decision for the, for, for the children and we gave them the temperature checks in the classroom and let them check each other's temperature check, you know, temperature and play with the thing and everything um, so that they felt very comfortable the next day when we held it up to their head. Um, we did ask the parents to check temperatures before they came though on that day. Uh, we mark on a checklist that it's done. Parent signs the iPad, iPad's disinfected. Ideally, eventually we will have, um, we will have it so that we, we do it and the parent doesn't touch it. If you use transparent classroom, the attendance can be modified. So this is how I modified it. Um, so I have a check for temperature checked, screening questions done, and then we 
we check temperature when they leave as well because we want to know that they didn't have a temperature when they were at school. That's great. Thank you for that. I'm just going to quickly pause and ask if anybody has a topic they'd like us to uh, insert uh, for next week, please chat that into me because I need to build my poll. So if there's something, if you have a burning desire for us to cover something uh, next Thursday, please chat it in and I'll build the poll shortly. I've got quite a few more, Christy. Are you good? Yep. I'm sorry. I'm not very brief. I, it's not my no, Well, you're doing a great job. This is <laughs> immensely valuable. So thank you for this. Uh, Brent's asking, are social distancing guideline, guidelines driving your class size? Is 12 the max given the six foot distancing? So 12 is the max given the six foot distance, but it's not what drove it. So this is how we've arranged things. This is the maximum. We took the floor plans and we just cut the school apart and we tried to figure out the maximum um, number we could have in different groups. Who's and first? initially licensing required only 10 children per group and it only changed last week that they say as few children as possible. But we wanna operate under essential care guidelines so we can always return to that. So we based it on 10 to 12. So smart. Are the same teachers doing in-class instruction at the same, same time they're doing distance learning? Um, they will be but we have Fridays off to facilitate that. And then we have one cohort, like of this, this cohort, for example, we've got one that will be younger children. Um, and that's, again, because we don't have enough. We have, um, we have about 20, um, well, about half of our kids are older kids, but there is just isn't enough to have a peer group to do the third one. So um, that, that, teacher will have their afternoon off every day and she'll be the main one facilitating distance learning. Right. And I think this question was answered, but I'll ask it again, just in case uh, from Lisa, do you clean the materials during the day with the children uh, while the children are at school? It seems like it would take a long time and seems more feasible for, before or after school. We do it before and after, and we also do it um, during. So after each use, and that's what that table is um, so that we would put them. Sorry, there's a lot of information here. You're welcome to peruse later, but I can't find it. But um, that's here. what that table is in the bottom left. It just lays out there. It really doesn't take that long. Um, we lay everything out. Even the trinomial cube, we have two of them um, because that does take a little bit longer. Um, and then one of the other things that we're working on, which um, has been helpful, is personal kits for the children. So there are certain things that are not shared, like pencils and all that kind of stuff. But we also looked at, um, we're creating a stamp game and a movable alphabet for every child that's at that level. So their initial, we're a very authentic AMI school. Um, we don't use other material, but um, one of the things that we found was the children really struggled at home with the made material. They just weren't used to it. And so because of the cleaning requirement and because of the likelihood that they're gonna go home, we thought if we can give the initial presentation with the real material, and then transition them to their own kit, then they can take that home with them when they go, you know, because we know we're gonna have periods of distance learning. Um, and so they can take that home. So we've started to make a list of the things that are hard to clean and materials that the children will use for many, you know, months. Mm. Uh, Emily's asking, do you have any of your staff for summer and or fall just very anxious and not returning? Um, no. We have one staff member that has some um, medical concerns and we're working with them on that, um, but not just, not anxious in general. Um, How are you handling cleaning of outdoor equipment, sand toys, etc.? cetera? Um, we have a fogger for the outside um, that does hypochlorous acid. So be between use of cohorts, we, um, we clean the playground material and the playground toys. Um, I'm using the, the um, licensing words for them. Um, but within the cohort, outside, we don't have to um, clean in between use. How often do you have to wash work rugs? We wash them weekly, but the children have their own work rugs. So they're assigned a specific work rug. How many teachers uh, are you assigning to a class size of 10? One. Uh, how do you enforce social distancing with toddlers? Um, it's not that hard because they tend to like to work alone. Um, so the big thing is putting their seats 
their, their tables further apart. We're not doing community lunch, which is a huge loss and has caused many tears to the teachers. Um, but, um, but we're doing, we, yeah, we just sep sit them further apart. And then one of the decisions we made, and this was one thing that I highly recommend talking to your parents about, is that it is unnatural for children to be able to maintain a six foot distance all the time. There's absolutely no expectation um, that they will. And I think I even here, this is the slide we show, showed them um, in the presentation. So we will absolutely get close to your child. The children will get close to them to offer comfort, to address injuries. If a child runs up and wants to hug someone who got hurt, we're not gonna stop them. We treat it the same way we do any grace and courtesy. We're not gonna make the child feel badly when they had no intent um, to do anything, uh, I don't even say wrong, because it's not really wrong, but, um, and we just treat it with a grace and courtesy um, at a different time, uh, reinforcing social distancing. This and toddlers, you know, just... that's the way it is. Um, one thing with toddlers that we have done also is created a, a uniform for them so that they change when they come into the classroom and they change when they leave. So that minimizes, we figure, Toddlers tend to have more bodily fluids on them. Um, and so that minimizes that transmission. And it's just, and it's really nice for the toileting because we don't get the really cute, adorable, impossible to undo um, clothes. And we have a lot more time since we're not doing the community lunch. Now there's a different you know, little ritual that they go through. Another quick pause for everybody on the call. Please visit the link I just dropped in the chat to vote for next week's topic. Um, are children bringing lunch boxes or using paper bags? How do you send work home? We are bringing, uh, they do bring lunch boxes and they put them in the cubbies, which are outside of the classroom. Once they enter the classroom, they don't bring anything other, you know, and they change shoes and everything. Um, and then we eat outside. And, you know, that's another thing. We're in California. So for the most part, we're going to be able to use the outdoor environment. Do you use plexiglass dividers for children to work on the same table or for teachers to give individual lessons? We do not in the children's house or YCC. Um, the tables are just separate, but we are looking at it. I saw Matt's presentation and we're, we might steal that idea for um, our elementary. We're, right now, they're just wearing masks when they're close. Uh, Susanna had a comment. In Illinois, lunch boxes are not allowed, so that may be gov governed by your own state's guidelines. No reusable containers of any kind can be used for lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, don't have, we can use lunch boxes, but we don't bring them into the environment. Another question about plexiglass from Tori. By the way, I had two people independently email me about where to get plexiglass. So if anybody has a beeline on uh, where to acquire materials, please let me know and I'll share that in our resources. Uh, Suzanne is asking, our state guidelines require cleaning materials after each use at a minimum. Curious to know how other schools clean the work rugs or do you have one for every child? And Christy, if I remember, you said that each child has their own rug, correct? Each has their own and then we just stick them in the laundry machine at the end of the week. And then Kristen had a great idea. She said, we're thinking of using yoga mats cut in half in lieu of work rugs. They can be easily cleaned. Yeah. Um, we use yoga mats out in our outdoor classroom. What an amazing amount of content you produced for us here. Like this presentation is just a gold mine. It's unbelievable. Well, I'm happy to share it. And it's a lot, it was easy because a lot of it's from our presentations to parents. So obviously there's, each slide has a mixed audience. Some are to you and some are to parents, but. No, that's okay. I, I noticed the presentation that you emailed me. I think it's missing a few slides. Would you send me what you have here? Yeah, and also I am going to take out the floor plan just for security purposes. Um, so In that you case, can kind of... I shared it on... Yours is not here. password protected, right? No, ma'am, it's not. Okay, so I'm going to take out the... Um, I'll take out the floor plan, so I'll put them up now just so people can see them. But, um, and if you want them separately, I'm happy to email them. I just don't want them up on the web. Um, so that's, this is our toddler community, our children's house, and it's a house, so you can imagine like a living room and a kitchen dining room area. And then this is our elementary, so that's the downstairs and that's the upstairs. This was so valuable, Christy, thank you so much. Um, sure. Somebody's asking, uh, Jay's asking, can I share the presentation? Yes, so just so everybody knows, uh, all resources from our town halls will be on needlemarketing.com forward slash town hall. Uh, and let me share that link now. Um, that includes the recordings and uh, any downloads that are referenced. Um, you're getting a ton of shout outs in the chat, Christy. Um, okay. And I'll link to that. Please make okay. sure that you vote for our next topic. And then I had two email questions 
Um, one of them is some of us are having issues getting some items at a reasonable price and in reasonable time. Face shields, plexiglass dividers, vital oxide, hand sanitizers. If any schools have uh, recommendations on where to buy them, please let us know. I know, um, I think it was Emily at Hands-On Montessori actually had some materials for sale. So Emily, if you're here, I think feel free to share those. And then um, somebody asked, are there any good suggestions for changing tables? Are people using a screen or plexiglass of any sort? I'd also love to hear about models for staggered arrival and dismissal. We have several entry exit doors, but they all feed off of our carpool line. So if you're using several doors or clog the line way too much. So if anybody has any input on that, we'd love to hear it. Um, and otherwise, next week, while we're waiting for our brave people to chime in, uh, it looks like we're going to be talking about uh, drum roll. It's pretty close right now between uh, increasing admissions and then bringing in prospective families who are on the fence. And those are kind of the same topic. So I think we can combine those two things and have, um, have a discussion just about uh, communication and, and maybe advertising. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Did I skip anything? In terms of the staggered drop-off, um, we, we are entering, we are having them enter in all different places, um, but two main entries. And what, one thing we've done is we've um, talked to a business nearby to see if our teachers can park there instead. And then we've used the um, parking area in front of the school as a staging area and put up shade structures so that we can gather the children first and then take them back as a group. Each cohort has its own little space. So that's one idea. That's brilliant too. Uh, Dean is asking the question about cleaning between uses. Uh, is that a regulation or guidance from the state? For us, it's a regulation in San Mateo. Uh, Emily's going to put together the resources that she has available and share them. Um, Tammy's asking if we can see the outside community photo again. Um, sure. And while you're doing that, Tori's asking regarding the floor plan, what do you divide classrooms with? Is that a curtain? Um, it's a, so most of them were already divided by walls because we're in a house. Um, let's see, how do I get back to this? But, um, but here, wait, let me get to it. So this is the floor plan. So this is a divider, which is like a classroom accordions divider. Um, we ended up not putting this on um, because the staff has to get up this way for admin. We just felt like that would give more space and we're just careful not to be near a child when we're coming up. Um, so yeah, that's, we don't use curtains. We have to use a solid barrier, uh, but it doesn't go up to the ceiling. And that's another area where I felt like airflow is so important that I didn't want to have anything go totally up to the ceiling and licensing didn't like that initially, but when I explained it, they, they were fine with it. And Don asked, you mentioned a wand to clean. What is the cost of the wand? Do you have to wait uh, before returning to the shelf and does it work for wood? Um, it works for everything, I think. Um, and it, it has a, it doesn't get into stuff. So, you know, you, you can't just put it over things and think that it's going to get between pieces. You have to really lay everything out. Um, and the cost is about $99. It's listed on, I, I got it, it from here. So I think it's listed on one of your resources. Um, and this is another area where we felt like there really isn't evidence of transmission from surfaces. And this is something that is, I'm more concerned with the children breathing in the cleaning chemicals constantly. Hmm. So I felt like this has enough evidence that I feel like it's a, you know, makes sense, but it's also less intrusive. So um, it depends. If you really want to make sure it's absolutely, totally disinfected, you probably want to spray it with something. But um, I would like to be able to remove our knoblets or uh, cylinder block pieces from the cylinder at some point. So I have a, a mild audible to pull and I hope nobody minds, but I just received an email from Kristen, who's one of our members. And she said that um, Dr. Karen Duca, who is a PhD biophysicist and chemist is willing to talk to us about the science of coronavirus. Um, is that a preferable topic than the ones that we have in the poll right now? Would y'all mind chatting in and let me know what your, your receptivity to that conversation would be? 
I'm getting a lot of yeses. Okay. That topic scares me a little bit just because it's so politically charged, but I feel like we can't avoid it. So we might as well get the information, especially given her pedigree. She sounds unbelievable. So first of all, Kristen, thank you so much. That's amazing. And uh, let's definitely invite her for next Thursday. I think we make that the topic. Um, what a powerful resource for us to have. That's, that's really wonderful. Thank you. Uh, awesome. And we've got about five minutes. We don't have to uh, belabor, but if we have more to talk about, we can talk about it. Kassim, this is Wally here. Hey, Wally. Just, uh, it's, not a, it's not a question, but a comment. Uh, I think Christy is very lucky to have such a long waiting list. Uh, most schools are not that blessed. Uh, so we have a little different dynamics to work with in terms of how we go about and how we communicate to the parents and what we do. And that's a challenge that many of us are facing. Uh, so uh, anyone has any comments on that? It would be nice to hear. I can share with you the data that I'm seeing from a Google Ads perspective. We run Google Ads for about 40 schools. And post-COVID, we saw a massive drop in um, conversions, but not as significant a drop in impressions, which is important because it tells you that parents were still interested. They weren't ready to engage. What we're just now starting to see, and I don't have more than two weeks worth of data on this, but it, it appears as the trend line is increasing from a conversion perspective. We do have some schools that are actually showing really positive. Um, it, it looks to be very uh, geographically based. I think the temperaments of different geographies are more receptive to coming in, um, specifically on the coasts. So uh, my hope is that that trend line continues. That's from the, the, you know, the evil marketer's lap. So the data that I'm seeing from Google shows uh, uh, some positive signs of life, but I imagine there you know, are feet on the street schools that might want to share their, their notes as well. Yeah, and I would say one thing to just consider is we, we do have, I mean, I didn't feel like it was responsible not to say that we have a, a, a wait list. So it allows me to you know, be pretty clear in our policies. But I will also say that we haven't lost anybody um, for being that clear. And I think people really want the certainty right now. And they, throughout my entire history of being, you know, this is now what, 15 years that we've, I, since I started the school and even through growing it, and we've been growing pretty much every year. Um, I do really believe if you're really good about the communication and you're really um, clear about what you won't sacrifice, um, the parents really do respect that. And, and um, I think they are coming back partly because they really trust that we are being very honest and clear with them about what we feel is the right thing to do. Well, and if you don't mind me saying your competitive market, non-Montessori schools are not going to be nearly as committed to remaining open for so many people. And that's not an indictment. For so many people, it's a business more than it is, you know, a mission. And so I think what we're going to see, given the economic fallout and the fact that, you know, the, the stimulus money is drying up, a lot of schools are going to be going under. We're going to see a massive closure across a lot of industries, and I think preschools is one of them. And so uh, the byproduct of that, and it's, it's a little morbid, but um, those parents are going to need to place their children somewhere. And uh, whether or not they're mon Montessori, you know, mission appropriate is a whole different discussion. It's something that Matt and I talk about a lot. But, you know, I feel like this is in a lot of ways a waiting game. If we can hold on long enough, you're going to see a little bit of that um, that burn off and then and then the excess inventory, if you will, that if you don't mind me sterilizing it is, is going to have to is going to have to go somewhere. So there's an opportunity there uh, if I can state it that way. Uh, Kasim, I just wanted to add we're in New Jersey. We're about 16 miles outside of Manhattan. And so we're in a hot spot, but not as hot a spot as Manhattan. And we're getting overflow leaving, leaving Brooklyn, leaving the city coming out to us. And one of the things that's been important for us is to make sure it's easy for parents to find on our homepage of our website. We're open. We plan to open. We're, we're open doing distance learning. We plan to open in the fall. Here's a virtual slideshow for you to look at. Uh, our director of Montessori development, who is also on here right now, has been doing a lot of virtual tours, Zoom meetings, phone calls. So we make it um, very clear on our website that we are open for business. And, uh, and we actually have had a lot of parents recently, a lot, we, we probably had 10 parents in the last couple of weeks who have enrolled sight unseen other than what they've heard on the phone or seen on our website. So I think the website is the key right now for getting that enrollment to continue to grow. That's so well said, Tori. Thank you for that. And I, I'd like to add to it, if you don't mind, uh, your second most important asset past your website, in my opinion, is your Google My Business profile. This is free to set up. It takes a few minutes. It's, it's also called a Google local listing. 
Um, but if you can make sure that your Google My Business profile is updated, including your updated hours, and uh, Google My Business allows you to post messages, post the same way you would to a Facebook page. Um, you can let parents know we are currently open and accepting, uh, accepting new enrollment. Um, Google My Business is what shows up when somebody looks for a school and the map listing shows up in the Google uh, search results. That map listing, that's powered by your Google My Business profile. So to Tori's point, your website has to be clear and you have to state very clearly that, you know, exactly what you want parents to do and the fact that you're open. Um, but before they get to your website, often the first line of defense is the Google My Business profile. And another note on that is if you can get some friendlies, some parents that, you know, you know, like, and trust to go there and write some reviews for you, just a small handful of reviews are going to make a really big difference as far as whether or not they're willing to click through. Um, so, so spend some time investing in that. We have a course in the Needle member area. It's only for our second play members, but if you're interested in it, uh, email me and I'll give it to you for free. Um, and it just walks you through the steps uh, to optimize your Google My Business profile. As a matter of fact, I'll just open that up for everybody and post it in the, the town hall resources. Um, when somebody imp uh, defined impression and conversion. Yes, sorry. Impressions in Google are just uh, is a, a, a numeric indication of the number of people that have seen your ad. So if somebody searches for Montessori school near me and our ad comes up, that's an impression. We have not seen a, a, a massive drop in impressions. The impressions have, have maintained to a relative degree uh, where they always have been. And that's such a strong indication that parents are still interested. The conversions are when they actually click on the ad, go to the website, and then fill out a form or download something or schedule a tour. We have seen a drop in conversions. And so that's, in my mind, a very clear indication that the interest is there, but uh, so is the trepidation. Parents want to know what's going to happen, and that makes sense. And Christy, I think what you did from a financial perspective is brilliant. It's very similar to what Matt did. Uh, change from annual to monthly, but allow them to save money by committing to annual, but then let them know this is it. Uh, and then I think that expectation management is really helpful. Uh, again, from a business perspective, it just, it lets people sort of choose their own adventure. Um, and then the fact that you only had two families switch to monthly, I think is really enheartening. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Uh, Y'all, I really love this group. This is such an amazing, wonderful group of people. If you don't mind, I know we're a few minutes over, but I'm going to be self-indulgent and tell you a story and you can drop off if you want to, because I know everybody's busy. Uh, my wife has a degree in international human rights. And she's like that person. She started the one foundation at her, uh, her university. She's been to the Middle East peacekeeping. She worked for Not My Kid. She does anti-bullying talks. Like she's like the most amazing human in the world. And it was pretty cool. Well, th this part isn't cool, but when the world was set on fire and all these you know, horrible things were happening between the pandemic and, and some of the riots and whatnot, she was really beside herself because she was saying, you know, I don't know what to do. And she's like the action taker. She's the one who goes out and does. And, you know, like she's, organizing protests or you just, they, they've lobbied in a, a Congress on Capitol Hill and she's gotten like laws passed and, and uh, was working with child soldiers in Africa. And, and now she's sitting here and she's like, I don't know what to do. And what was cool for me is I know exactly what to do. I'm like, I'm going to go help Montessori schools. And it's, it's cool. Cause I just feel like I have such a purpose and um, y'all have, you know, done that. So thank you. And that's it. Let's call it a day before it gets any more sappy. Appreciate <laughs> you guys, and I'm going to see you next Thursday. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much, Christy. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, Bye. Christy.